Okay, today we've come to a very important point which uh, needs a lot of careful approach and that is how to handle high-level procedures and calls. Sometimes in Java they're called invocations of methods in a low-level language like assembly. So sec we're at the beginning section 2.8 in your textbook which is called supporting procedures uh, which are also known as methods or functions in our uh, computer hardware. In order to do that, we're going to have to have what we talked about in the last lesson, the ability to jump and return, to be able to go somewhere and find our way back. And so that's what we're going to introduce today. Um, our procedure call instruction is going to be JAL, jump and link, and what's given after that is going to be the location that you want to jump to. And what it will do is it will save the address of the next instruction, the program counter plus four. Don't forget the program counter is pointing to here. So program counter plus four points to whatever the next instruction is. That's where we want to return after the call. So this says go and execute that procedure found at this address. And when you're finished, return to here and keep on executing commands. So we go, execute a sub function or procedure or method, whatever your language wants to call it. And then we come back and we continue. So we save the value of this in a special register, which we call the return address register, RA, register 31, in order to have a link to the next instruction for the procedure call. In other words, let me give an analogy. If you go for a walk in deep woods, there's a risk that you will get lost and not find your way back. So you know what people do? The famous fairy tale says Hansel and Gretel left breadcrumbs behind them. They said, great, now we'll, no matter where we go, we'll be able to follow our own trail back. But as you know, in the fairy tale, something bad happened. The birds came along and ate the breadcrumbs and they were lost. But this is breadcrumbs that won't get eaten by anybody. It'll be in the return address register. It'll say how to get home, how to get home. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to have a jump instruction, which has a six-bit uh, opcode field, the code for jump and link, and a 26-bit address field, which says where do you want to jump to. And when this is the JAL code, you'll go to that and you will save in the return address register, RA, which is also numbered 31, you'll save the return address. Okay, now that means that after you have um, come to that place in your code where you say JAL, you know, to function, and function is over here, and function's got some code, at the end of function you have to be able to continue. So you're going to go back to, if this was the value of the PC, then this value of PC plus 4 is the next instruction. You've saved that in your return address register. So in fact, the return address register saves PC plus 4 in order to be useful at the return. So now when we've executed all this code, it's time to return. We want to go back to and execute that. Of course, our PC is some different value now. Luckily, we saved the in value of this instruction right there. So in order to return, we have a, another jump called jump return or jump register. The JR instruction does the following. When you say JR to register 31, it says go look in register 31 and get the value that's there and stick it in the program counter. Stick it in the program counter, okay? So our program counter, just in case you want to know, goes from, let's just say here, 0, 4, 8, this would be um, C, and this will be 1, 0, okay? I'm doing it in, in uh, octal, or sorry, uh, hexadecimal base 16. After this instruction C, we're going to go over here to the function, which who knows what it's going to be, you know, uh, uh, 34, 38, uh, uh, 30C, 40, 44, whatever. When I get to here, it's going to say, go look here and read what's stored here. Well, if C was the jump point, then C plus 4, Yanni 10, PC plus 4 is stored here. This is going to essentially say, go back and execute instruction 10. So that means we continue from here. So we save the return address in a register. We totally change the flow of control. We go to some other place in the program. We execute those. But this says return, which means look in register 31 and find those breadcrumbs and go home Hansel and Gretel. Okay, that's what it means. Find the breadcrumbs and they'll lead you back home. Of course, you had to store them there in the first place, but that's one of the automatic 
things done by the JAL instruction automatically puts the value of the return address in register 31 for you. You do not have to do that manually. Okay? So now, if you'd like to know what we're really doing here, this right here is a call, and this right here is called a return. Call and return. I don't know if you've ever heard of those before in your discussions of high-level languages, but that's what we're doing. At low level, we're giving the structures in order to implement high-level method invocation and return, or procedure call and return, or function call and return. The things that high-level languages do, we have to provide the structures for those in our low-level language. Okay, are there any questions about this? It's a nice pair, J-A-L to get there, and J-R to get home. It's like a round-trip ticket. Okay, now let me ask a question. If I change this to just jump to function, what happens now? It's not called What happens now? Jump to function. <coughs> yeah, there's no breadcrumbs in register RA, so we don't return anywhere. So therefore, we'll go here and we'll execute this, and when we get to this, it'll say, Go out to register 31 and see what's there. And what will be there will be some junky value left over from before, and you'll launch into outer space and go somewhere that you don't want to go, and your program will crash because you'll be out of the address space of your program. Okay? So in order, there has to be a good value there in order for this to work. So what puts the good value there? The fact that this is J-A-L, jump and link. Are there any questions associated with this um, ability to call and return? Okay, so the next time your Java interpreter sees a method invocation, the next time your C compiler sees a call to a function, this is what's happening down at the low level, okay, in whatever assembly language. All assembly languages have to have something like this in order to support uh, method call and, you know, procedure call, etc. Okay, good, I, that went well. I, I'm surprised that, that there aren't more questions. Yes, okay. Uh, the GR, the, yeah. uh, if we write that only G only jump okay then uh, if we write there J then we can't write there this if you remember the J instruction format looks like this it's got an op and then it's got what an address yeah exactly any address okay so the address can be things like function it can't be it, that's not an address. Okay, so it does, it's not compatible with it. Huh? Okay, so now for the JR instruction, what kind of format does it use? He asked a question about the J instruction. It, the J and the JAL use this because it's the opcode and then the place you want to jump to. But the JR doesn't use the J. It uses the R format. Look at this. Oh, my goodness. It has a zero here and says look here to figure out which one it is. So that means it's the JR. And then it uses one register, so you put the value there, it means ignore, ignore, ignore. Yeah, it needs an R format in order to do it. So JR, even though it's a jump, is not J format. It's R format jump. Everybody notice that? Okay. So we've got three jumps so far. J-A-L, J, and J-R. There's one more. J-A-L-R, okay. And these two use the J format. And these two use the R format, because okay, they use registers as the destination. In other words, if you want to know where to go for these two, look in the instruction. If you want to know where to go for these two, look in the register. The register contains the address that you'll jump to, or the instruction contains the address that you'll jump to. That's the difference. And if you want to contain the address in the instruction, you need a very big field. Any questions? So those are our four jumps in the MIPS assembly language and MIPS instruction set architecture. All right, so let's now talk about the program that does the calling, which we're going to call the caller, and the program which is called, and we're going to call that the callee. So caller, callee, that's the terminology that we, the one doing the calling, and the one being called. In Turkish, I'm sure you have something similar. Charan, charalan. Okay. All right. The main pro procedure, or the main routine, or the one doing the calling, we're going to call the caller, it places parameters 
in a place where the callee can get them. Don't forget, I, uh, very often when I invoke a method, for example, on, uh, okay, uh, I have to send him some parameters so he can do it with those. I don't just say do your thing, I say do your thing with these values, please. Okay, so we're going to pass parameters. So now the issue gets a little more complicated. How do we pass parameters? Well, there's certainly no way to pass parameters here. Look, that just says, I want to call it, and there's where it is. There's no extra fields for here's parameter A, here's parameter B, etc. So therefore, we have to define how we're going to pass the parameters. We'll get to that in just a minute. The, there are four argument registers, if you remember, A0, A1, A2, and A3. Four of our registers have special purposes. We call them the argument registers. And these are for the parameters that are being passed into the callee. You can pass up to four things from the caller into the callee by placing them in the argument registers. After the JAL, the jump, the callee says, I've been called. I'll find my parameters in the argument registers. In other words, I know, okay, he wakes up, says, oh, William called me. I guess he passed me the two parameters that I need. I'll find my A and B in register A0 and register A1. If we have an Alashma that passes four parameters, you'll find them in A0, A1, A2, and A3. And so the caller transfers control to the callee. The callee acquires the storage resources that are necessary including um, whatever is needed for its, its task. It performs the desired task using the values of the argument register, performs what it's been asked to do. Now, often in called methods or procedures, there's a result value which is passed back. If it's an enormous structure, then a pointer to the structure is passed back. If it's small enough, we pass the values back. I think you've probably heard about you know, passing values and passing pointers in some of your courses. So if it's a big thing, I don't want to give you a copy of every one. I just say, there it is. Go get it. It's over there. If it's a little thing, I'll just pass it to you. So uh, we're going to place the result value. OK, I may have one or two result values that I'm asking in a place where the caller. Now we're talking about data being passed back this way. The first thing with the call was, Arguments going this way, now we're talking about values going back this way. And we're going to use two registers which are special purpose for the values, the V0 and the V1 register. We call them the value registers or the result registers. Okay? So we can pass four in and pass two back. Now, I don't know if you're you know, uh, okay with that or not, but I've seen plenty of uh, programs that called things that passed in more than four and back out more than two. So you might write, say, well, Hoja, that's very sweet and very nice, but what happens when the situation gets big? It's a great question. I hope you were thinking of it. I, I know you were. I can see you nodding your head. Of course, <laughs> you know, that's very nice, but the world is more complicated than that, Hoja. Please don't sell us, you know, pembe toes. We want to know how the whole thing works. I hope that you're thinking critically like that. I hope that you're, in a, as a learner, always saying, okay, but, okay, but, I'm a, what if, a but in this situation, you know, think generally, ask the hard questions. If you don't ask the hard questions, someone will ask you the hard questions, and that's when it's very uncomfortable, because now you're the one being asked the question, you've never thought about it before, you never bothered to ask somebody else, and I don't know, I never thought about it, is a really embarrassing answer when you're being paid big money as an engineer, and you know, you're supposed to be the expert on something, so it's not actually a good situation to be in. I don't know, and I never thought about it, I'm not intellectually curious. Maybe you shouldn't be working at that job then, you know? I, there's simpler things that we can do at lower pay for you, if that's your worldview, right? Okay, so, urunda bile delem deme. That's just not a good answer. All right, so let's think about that. What do you do if you need more than four argument values? What, if you need, what do you do if you need to pass more than two result values? What could we do? Well, we already said one thing. We said if it's a big structure, just pass a pointer to the beginning of it. That's nice. But what if there's five structures that need to be passed in or three structures that need to be passed out? <laughs> then there's only room for four pointers going in and two pointers coming out, and you're still short. So then what? Are registers the only place we can store things in a computer system? No. Where else can we store things? Memory. Great. Could there be any place in memory where I write it and you read from it? I mean, that's what's being done here. The caller writes and the callee reads from. Or the callee writes and the caller reads from. We just have to have an unlashmala shared area. Okay, registers are nice because they're fast, but we can deal with it. If they're all full, then we go to memory. 
And we say the caller puts it in if it's extra arguments, and the callee reads them out if it's extra arguments, or terse. The callee puts it in if it's extra result values, and the caller reads it out. Why not? There's a special area of memory that's really good for that kind of passing. Do you know what that's called? It's a temporary little place where lots of things get put on and put off and passed around. You know what that's called? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not cash, no. Not cash, no, not cash. Not cash, no. What? Hash. Hash. <laughs> <laughs> not hash. I'm still waiting. Who took this course before? Raise your hand if you took this course before. Okay, <laughs> you're in trouble. Where would we? Yes, Ozera knows. Stack, we pass it on stack. Oh, fair enough. Oh, fair enough. We pass it on stack. That's exactly right. Stack is the place where you might call it the temporary scratch pad area of memory reserved for you. Okay? The temporary scratch pad area of memory reserved for you. And if you like, stack, stack. Now, how many of you have heard of stack in CS201? It's an abstract data type, ADT. Heard of stack? Did you know that computers really have them? <laughs> They're not just an abstract data type. They're real and we use them all the time. Yeah, oh yeah, oh man, don't, you know, okay, let me be like that, man. You know, no, the real purpose of teaching you about queues and stacks and trees and all those things is they're very, very useful. Yeah, okay, so don't be afraid of a stack. It's our good friend here. When you have more than the number of input parameters or output value parameters, then your architecture allows in hardware, in registers, Yanni, then put it in stack. Okay, so let's finish up. The callee uh, can now, um, uh, after uh, putting the values in the value registers where the caller can get them, it then returns control. So did we see here we transfer control caller to callee, we return control from callee back to caller. So what we've done here in calling a method or a procedure is Transfer control and input parameters at the beginning, and then transfer control and output parameters at the end. That's basically it. Okay. Now, sounds so simple, but you'd be amazed at how many CS224 students really have trouble when it comes to assembly language programming of those simple things. I better study that because you're going to be writing a lot of code that does that, and it's written differently than high level. I mean, how is high-level code written? You name the callee, you put a parentheses, you throw your parameters in the parentheses by name, not by location, you close the parentheses, and magic happens and a value comes back to you, and you don't have to do anything about location of those things. You don't have to transfer control back to yourself, do you? It just kind of comes back, wow, oh, here I am again, I'm, I better execute the next line of my high-level language program. It's the big magic. But now we're opening up behind the magic, and you know if you've ever been to a stage magic or an illusionist show, there's an explanation for every trick, of course. Right? It's not really boo you. The guy has tricks and ways. I just watched the illusionist movie the other night. I don't know if you saw that film. It's a great film. But anyway, you know, there's a reason behind everything that happens at a high level. And it's not magic, and you're looking at behind the curtain. We're actually showing you the tricks right here in this assembly language uh, course. Okay, so. Uh, and then the way we return the control is, of course, through the RA register. We talked about that already before. JRRA allows us to, um, and RA is the code for 31, so we can write it like that too. Same thing. We can write this one here as 31 too. They're equal. Same thing. All right. Now let's go over again. I'm going to wait, or I'm going to delay you a little bit here. Let's go over again the. Uh, software convention for the usage of our registers. We have 32 registers. One of them is set aside and reserved with a constant zero, can never be written into, can only be read from. But the other 31 are general purpose. Anything you want to do with them, you can do. But if you want to play the game with my ball, you play by my rules. That's how all street games are played all around the world. Hey, you want to join the game? Here's the rules, kid. Play with us by our rules or go home and play with another ball on another street. It's the same thing here. If you want to program compatibly with operating systems and other user programs in 
you know, assembly language or any other language, you obey the conventions. And there's conventions. And here's some of the conventions. These three registers, number four through seven, are going to be reserved for sending arguments into called routines, like we just talked about. And these two registers, which are two and three, are going to be reserved for sending the return values back out. T0 through T9, those 10 temporaries can be used for just about anything you want. And the callee can use them even if you were using them. So imagine that. Right before this, you say, put a value in T0. And over here, this one says, I'd like to put a value in T0. And you know what? When you return here, your value is not there anymore. Because it says it can be overwritten by the callee using T0. These are temporary. They're very free. Nobody's saving them. Nobody's promising them, oh, I promise I won't touch the temporaries. Whatever you put in them, it'll be OK. There's no promise like that at all. But for the eight saved registers, there is such a promise. That's why they're called saved. So if I put a value in S0 here, whatever that is, you know, value 4, I will, after the call and return, the 4 will still be in S0. It's called a saved register. Now, why will it be there? Because the callee agrees to obey the convention, which is that these registers must be preserved. They must be saved. So either you obey that convention by not using it at all, right? Or you obey the convention by, before you use it and change it, you store it away. S0 goes to stack, maybe, or some other safe place. And when you're done, just before you come back, the stored value comes back. So get it? I saved it, now I used it, now I restored it. So the value here was put on the stack and then put back into S0 when I return. Right here, it's the same as it was here. So you save it. You either save it by not touching it, or you save it by restoring it. Imagine that uh, my daughter says, Dad, can I borrow the car? And I say, sure, but bring it back just like you found it. So she says, oh man, you know, I better not get it dusty or dirty or in any way get a scratch on it. So she just decides to take a taxi and she hands me the keys back and says, okay, Dad, the car's just like you gave it to me. Of course, it's still in the driveway. Did it go anywhere? It's, of course, it's just the same. That's one option. Don't use it. The other one is, okay, Dad, I promise to bring the car back just the way that you loaned it to me. She goes out and drives around and gets it muddy and dirty and scratches the paint. And then she goes to a car wash and gets it clean and goes to a body shop and gets the uh, retouche done. And the paint is all cleaned up. She brings it back says, here, Dad, here are the keys. It's just like I borrowed it. I go out and look. Oh, yeah, it's great. Thanks so much. What did you do? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> okay, you either clean up the mess or you don't make it in the first place. That's the promise with the saved registers. You either don't use them, or if you use them, you save the old value, use it, and then put the old value back before you're done so nobody knows that you changed it. That's the anlashma about the saved registers. There's no such anlashma about the temporaries, but there is about the saved registers. Then we come to the big f five, is it, or six here. Global pointer, no, it's four. Global pointer, stack pointer, frame pointer, and return address register. Notice it's 28, 29, 30, and 31. These are very special registers. They all have a system purpose. We've just been looking at register 31. We've talked about what the return address register's special purpose is. And it's very clear, isn't it? It's to put the value of the PC plus 4 when a JAL is executed or when a JALR is executed. Notice they both have the AND link. So when you see AND link, you're going to be using the return address register to store the linked value. In other words, the return address. We've talked about stack. I said you could push it onto the stack. Well, that means that the stack needs to have a top of stack pointer. And when we push, that changes because the new value went on. When we pop, that changes because the top value came off. We all know about stack, so I don't need to talk much more about it. This is points to top of stack. This one points to top of stack. The last two, frame pointer and global pointer, those have to do with, uh, yeah, how can I describe it? Static data, I guess if that means anything to you. Uh, programs have both static data and dynamic data. Static, another way, maybe global data might mean something to you, accessible by everybody. Local data is not accessible by everybody. This data, therefore, has a fixed section that all can see. So we're going to have a pointer pointing to that fixed section of globally accessible data. And then frame pointer in register 30 points to the location of an activation record, sometimes called a stack frame. And I'll talk more about that a little bit later. Notice that the callee 
If they're going to use or touch or in any way bother the big four, they have to save them and then restore them. These are very special, and you're not allowed as the callee to make changes to those. They must be left identical. So that upon return, they're just the same as they were upon before the call. These are very important to preserve. These also must be preserved. You notice, must be saved, restored by callee. Must be saved, restored by callee. These have a restriction on their usage. Okay? These don't, these don't, these don't. That's another way to say it. These don't have any restriction on their usage. If you like, you can destroy the input arguments that were given to you. Okay? You're not under obligation to preserve them. If you like, you can destroy the value in the result register as it was given to you. Maybe you will anyway by putting your own result in. I mean, this called procedure, this callee, does not have to keep the A's the same as they were on the way in as it were on the way out. Doesn't have to keep the V's the same that they were on the way in as they were on the way out. Probably won't. Probably will write values into V. Doesn't have to keep the temporaries the same on the way out as they were on the way in, but has to keep the S, the GP, the SP, the FP, and the RA the same. That's what it means by preserving a register. What is it? How do we preserve it? Remember the analogy with the keys? Ya don kunma, ya kulan ama temizle. When you're all done. Think about the car. Either you don't touch it, don't drive it, stays right where it was parked, or else after you drive it, you get it cleaned up inside and out and fix any scratches and make sure it looks as good as it did when you received it. Okay, so are there any questions about those register conventions? Any questions about those register conventions? Yeah, or Yeah, obviously passing through registers is faster than passing through memory because going to registers to read and write is always faster than going to memory to read or write. So yes, anything that's anything that's got Yeah, but you know what? One is faster than two, even if they're both in register because one requires one register read and one register write. Pardon? Big difference between four and five. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. The fifth one is much more expensive than the fourth one because it's not local. Now it's way over there in memory. That's exactly right. Good. I'm glad you got that point. Okay. Good. All right. A quick review here. JAL procedure label. Uh, the address of the following instruction is put in the return address. It jumps to the target address. That's the, called the target address. It's the address of the instruction that you want to jump to. The return is JR, but we don't give an address. Instead, we give the register in which the address has been stored. Okay, and this will simply do this. It'll copy that value into the program counter. Okay, and we could also use um, this RA for computed jumps. So what you would do is you would compute the target you want to go to and then stick it in the RA and then do JR RA. And an example of how you might do that is the case switch statements. Okay? If you think about it, case switch looks like this. It says test something and then maybe go there, or maybe go there, or maybe go there, or maybe go there, or maybe go there. But there you know, based on alternatives, you know, if it's one, do this. If it's two, do this. If it's three, do this. If it's four, do this. If it's you know, five or six, do this. If it's seven, you know, or or you know, greater. Da, 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 do all those. So we've got multiple branches, multiple choices. What does it mean, do this? It means go to the code that's here and do that, or else here go to some other code and do that, or here go to some other code and do that. This code has a different address from this code. This code has a different address. They all have to have different addresses unless you want to do the same thing. Here I'm doing the same thing. So obviously what I do for five and what I do for six is, is this code. So that means that I have addresses for all these different code sections. And what I want to do is, Come here, do the test, and then jump to the code I want to go to. Does everybody see why a computed jump would be a really good thing to do? Now, you can do if else, 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 you know, until you're blue in the face. But that nested if else thing is slow, and the code is ugly and complicated, and it's prone to mistakes. So, yeah, implementing a case switch with nested if else's is possible in theory. Try doing it in practice with, you know, six or eight or ten branches and see how you like it. Okay? We've all used case switch statements. They're really nice and clean in a high level language. How about trying to make them nice and clean also in the low level language which implements them? If you say, ah, I don't care, make it ugly, well then fine, do nested if else's. 
If you say, well, it was nice and clean in the high level, easy to understand, then let's do an analogous nice and clean implementation in the low level language, then this computed jump will be very useful to you. Let's say you can, I say, I don't care if it's clean or ugly, I just want speed. Well, then you'll find that the computed jump is faster also. So it's both easier code to write and understand and maintain, and it's faster also. Okay, so we'll see an example of that a little bit later on, but that's a second usage for the JR besides just return. I mean, think about it. What it says is when you get to this point, go to somewhere which has been computed and stored for you in that register. Well, that's great for returns from calls, but it's also great for when you get to this point, go to somewhere which has been computed and pre-stored for you in some register, meaning go here, or meaning go here, meaning go here. Yeah, so we could use it for that as well. All right, now a new concept called leaf procedure. I think everybody has got some understanding that in tree structures, that's called the root, and that's called a leaf. It's kind of like we took a tree and turned it upside down, okay? So the root is the place where they're all connected. The leaf is a place where it doesn't go any further, right? Okay, so given that meaning of leaf, um, a leaf procedure is one that doesn't call any more procedures. This one is not a leaf because there's a JAL and it calls somewhere else. This one is a leaf because there's no JL, it doesn't call anywhere else. Okay, so if you're the end of a call chain, then you're the leaf. Okay, can we see here that um, in this example, uh, this uh, leaf example doesn't call anywhere. It can be called by leaf example, it just does some mathematic calculations and returns. So it's a leaf. You can call it, it'll do this, and it returns, but it does not in turn call anywhere else. If it called anywhere else, then we would say it's a non-leaf procedure. These are non-leaf procedures because when they are called, they call somewhere else. Okay, in fact, this one makes two calls, calls that and calls that. You say, wait a minute, Hoja, you're using a binary tree to talk about calling in program structures. Yeah, sure, why not? Okay. I mean, I can make all kinds of trees. How about this tree? That one calls this one, that one calls this one, that one calls both of those leaves. That's a call chain or a call tree. Of course, trees are great structures for modeling lots of things. All right, so what we're saying is, in a leaf procedure, then the arguments are passed in in the A registers. Turns out I've got four of them. Nice match up to A0, A1, A2, and A3. And I'm going to calculate F and return the value f, so that would be a nice matchup for v0. Everybody agree to that? Yeah. Four input parameters, one output parameter. That looks like a good matchup. So let's turn that into MIPS code, okay? The last thing I'm going to do is jrra, that says go home. The thing I need to do before that is get the value into v0, okay? And it looks like what I'm doing is computing it in s0 and then transferring it. Can everybody see that adding these two together just transferred it from here to here. So I computed it in S0, and then I put it in V0, then I did a little something else, and then I returned. When I returned, control went back to whoever called leaf example, and the value that it computed of whatever it was, um, GHIJ, was that it? Yeah, G and H added together, I and J added together, then subtract the two, it's done right here. Here's G and H, these two A parameters added together. Here's i and j, these two uh, a parameters added together, and then subtracting this temp and that temp from each other to put the result in here, and then transferring it over to v0. Can everybody see that it would be easy to eliminate this transfer? It's unnecessary. I don't need to have this transfer. All it does is move from s0 into v0. Why didn't I put it in v0 in the first place? Why well, put it in S0 and then move it right out? That's a wasted extra instruction. You see that? For efficiency reasons, I'll just put V0 here. Put the value in the value and then return. Does everybody see that? Yeah. There's no reason to use S0 because all I'm doing is putting it in and then moving it right out again. Okay. Now let's ask what's this and what's this? I understand what that is. That's the arithmetic. I understand what that is. That's go home with the value in V0. What am I doing here and what am I doing here? All right. Watch close. I am saving S0 onto the stack. 
saving something on the stack. We call that a push when you add a new element to the stack. First, what I do is I take the stack pointer and I decrease it by four, which means move it to the next empty memory location that can take a word. And then I'm saying take uh, the value in S0 and store that word into this memory address, which is what? The new empty adjusted stack pointer location. So stack pointer used to point to the last value on the stack. We said, great, change it to the empty location right below that, I guess right below that, and then put the new value there. So the stack is growing down. When you push, the stack is growing down. So the model that it would look like is this. Stack grows from the max address down this way. So right now the stack pointer points to that location right there. If you want to put something new on the stack, you know, any push, what do you do? First make the stack pointer point to this location, then write it in there. How do you write to memory from register? We call it a store word. Remember that from the last lesson? Well, you already write to memory from register, we call it store word. So that pushed onto the stack. Why did we save S0? So that we can write our own value into S0. But if we leave now with our own value in S0, it means that it's changed. The value, original value was on the stack. So before we go home, we've got to restore it. That's called a pop. You guys done? OK, please don't talk during the class. All right, so we pushed at the beginning of our procedure. We're going to pop at the end of our procedure. What does pop from stack mean? Pop from stack says the value that you have on the, shall we call it, top of stack. You know, it, you, you might, yeah, but hold you, it's growing down. Doesn't matter. We still call this the top of the stack. It's the value where the freshest, newest, last pushed value is found. So it's called the top of the stack. To pop, what do we want to do? Take a copy of that value and put it into register, and then forget that we ever had it and move the stack pointer back to where it was now. So that means this is now garbage and we think that this is the top of the stack, which it is because we don't care. This is now free to put something new on top of. Does everybody understand that? You don't go in the memory and go, excuse me, I'm erasing you. You got to be all zeros. We just back off the pointer and we, now it's free and you can put something new in. You know, taking off doesn't mean you know, clean it up and erase it and you know, it's not like that. It's just, it's bits. And you either know that they're valid or you know that they're invalid. As soon as I back off the stack pointer to here, these are now invalid. Yeah, I mean, it's open memory, free to write on. Are we OK so far? Now, these are quite technical concepts. These are quite complicated concepts. If you're following along with me, ah, oh, Ferrin, it's not easy stuff. This is quite a technical and complicated lesson, OK? So we're going one concept after another. Who are you understanding most of it? What percent? 60, 80, 90, 95? 95. 95, oh, great, it's great. How about you? How much, how much are you following this and understanding it? 95, great, okay. Fulia, right? Fulia? Yeah. 95 or 90? 90, okay, that's pretty good. I'm glad. All right, so what, is our, what does our pop look like? Well, the first thing is take the value and load it into the place that it needs to go to in, in register. And the second one is change the stack pointer back. What do we do here? We added negative 4. So what are we doing this time? Adding positive 4. All right, so the stack pointer, we now made it move closer to the maximum value. Yeah, and it was here. We moved it up to here. OK, so let's look at our leaf procedure. What does it do? It saves on the stack anything important that we need to change but don't have the right to change. Then it does the necessary work that it's supposed to do in its own procedure. Since it's a leaf, it doesn't call anybody else. So now it's time to put the result value in the um, parameter passing register V0, or wherever it's supposed to go. And then it's time to clean up the stack and leave the stack just as it was and restore anything that you used in the meantime, like S0. See, look, we saved it, used it, restored it. Now. I told you earlier how to save one line of code, but in fact, it saves five lines of code, doesn't it? Because if I use v0 here, then I'm not using s0. I don't need that anymore. I don't need that anymore, do I? So I save one, two, three, four, five lines of code just by putting v0 here. Can anybody 
guess why this code is so inefficient? Why in the world would an example like that uh, be shown when it's so bad? It's twice as big as it needs to be. Yeah. Exactly, for pedagogical reasons. Only to show how pushing onto stack and popping off of stack is necessary if you use one of the, you know, saved registers. Okay? That's the only reason. Yeah, it's a bad example. I recommend you don't do this in real life, but for pedagogical purposes, your Hoja showed you a bad example. Okay, shame on me. <laughs> All right, any questions about this? The implementation of a leaf procedure. Now, by telling you this is a leaf procedure, I hope you're feeling, okay, that means there's something different about this category than this category. Because I haven't showed you how to deal with non-leaf procedures, only leaf procedures. And leaf procedures are only the ones at the end of the chain. Line, look here. That's a leaf, that's a leaf, that's a non-leaf, that's a non-leaf, and that's a non-leaf. So we have solved less than half of the software issue by showing how to do leaf procedures, but there's more that needs to be shown. And you should be feeling that curiosity, saying, that's nice, Ama. Okay, yet mez. Come on, Hoja. Show us a little bit more important things. Okay, non-leaf procedures. Now, these are procedures which themselves call other procedures. Huh. Just like this one here says, you want me to do something, tamam, but I'm going to get my friend to help me. I'm going to call him. Did you ever do that in life? Somebody says, okay, we need you to do blah, 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 blah. And you say, okay. And then you call your friend. Hey, I need some help doing this thing. You know, just getting help from friends. That's a good thing. No problem. So here's what happens. We call it a nested call, okay? The caller needs to save on the stack its return address. We didn't do that in the last one because it was a leaf. Let's try this here. We know that it's very, very important that this register right here not be changed anywhere in here. Is there any line of code here that changes RA? No. So the breadcrumbs are still sitting in the register 31 where we put them. Not junk, but PC plus 4, that's great. Now we can go home. Now watch this. So, come into the thing that's been called, do this, do this, and now do a jump and link and go somewhere else. And then when you return, come here and do this and do this and do this, 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 this. And now I'm going to ask you the same question. When I get here, is there anything in here that changed the value of my return address register? Yeah, this did. We know that this changes what's in RA. So you know what? When you get here, the birds have eaten your breadcrumbs and you're not going to be able to get home. Whoever called leaf example expects that when you get to here, it comes back and continues. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. You know what's going to happen instead? Tell me what value is in RA when we get here. What value is in RA when we get here? That's right. The, the address of this instruction right here. Okay. PC plus 4 got this address, got put into... Register 31, when you did this, so it's whatever it is, you know, that PC plus 4, of leaf example, not of the caller, and it stays there, stays there, stays there, stays there, stays there, and when you do this, you know where you go? You code it right there. You don't go back to the one that called you. You just self-loop here. Oh, my goodness, you're stuck in a self-loop. You're never going to go home. You know what that's like? You hear about people in the wilderness. They get lost, and they think they're working their way out, but what they find that they've actually done is... Oh my goodness, I've been here before. You know, it's so discouraging to find that you've actually walked in a circle, spent all your energy, and you've not gotten any closer to civilization and being saved. That's why they say, stay in one place. If you're ever lost in the wilderness, don't spend your energy wandering around. Stay in one place until the, they find you, okay? Conserve your energy. Don't be wandering around, because that happens so commonly. I think it's, uh, you know, it all starts to look alike, and you end up coming back to the same place you've been before. Okay, so that means that Leaf is no longer a leaf. Now let's say non-leaf because we put a call in. There's a nested call here. Can you tell me how to get the right value of RA here? That's right. Right here I have to push 
the RA, which is the one I want, before I do this. And then right before this, I have to pop the RA back off, don't I? And if I pop it off, then the one I want is here for this. If I don't, then I get this one, which is not the one I want. Ah, you have to preserve not only any saved registers, but what else did we say? The big four. Stack pointer, if you mess around with them. Return address, which we are messing around with, obviously. Frame pointer and global pointer. All those have to be saved along with the S register. If you touch them, then bring them back exactly like they were before, just like the car example. If you touch it, if you don't touch it, everything's cool. No problem. Leave it in the driveway parked. But if you get in there and turn the key and drive it, you better put it back just like you found it. Clean, nice, all the scratches touched up. The interior's just the way it was. Everything's back in its place. Gotta be, okay? All right, so that's our, so therefore, you must save the return address and any arguments and temporaries that are needed after the call, okay? Now, we didn't actually go through that, but maybe we could. How about if I go back again? Let's try this, okay? Right here, if I put in a jump, can everybody see that T0 is important after the jump? I need it here in order to do this come if I put in the JAL right here and go somewhere else that procedure that I'm calling has the right to change my T0 doesn't it yeah so you know what I should do I should make this an S so that it doesn't have the right to change it can everybody see that if I make if what I'm keeping is important and I put it in an S then my callee promises to preserve it or not drive it at all yeah, you got to think about that. If you have a jump here in the middle of a calculation, your temporaries are not guaranteed to come back the way that you left them. Mm. So anything that you need to continue your calculation, as it says here, any arguments and temporaries that are needed after the call, you better preserve them. Now, it doesn't say any saved registers. You don't have to go about preserving those. Why? Because those are... Sigorta Kapsam Altenda. Those are Garanti Altenda. Those are preserved because they are saved. But we already said, these are free. Change them as much as you want. These are free. Change them as much as you want. Remember? About three slides back, I said, Sir Best, Sir Best, Sir Best. Well, that's fine, but it means that the callee can kill them, change them. If they're important to you, you had better save them on the stack. Caller needs to save them on the stack first. Just like this, which is important to you to go home, those are your breadcrumbs, better save them. You also better save any arguments or temporaries which are needed after the call. If you don't need them after the call, you know what it means by after the call? It means this. If I put my JAL here, that's my call. Then if I need it afterward, if I put it here, then it afterward means after the call. If I need them, then I better preserve them. Okay. All right, and then after, after you do that, you restore things from the stack after the call. In other words, you push them on the stack to make them safe, you did the call, your callee did its thing, it returned to you, and now that you've returned, you can bring them back from the stack and continue and use them. All right, so here's our non-leaf example. It's factorial, which takes an input parameter n, and it says if n is less than 1, return 1 as the answer, else return n times factorial of n minus 1. So everybody can see that factorial, or fact calls fact. It's a non-leaf. It's a non-leaf. Fact calls fact, therefore this is a non-leaf procedure. Okay, so the argument register is going to be passed in A0. And the result of this thing, which says return this or return that, has to be passed out in V0. Those are normal expectations. Pass it in in the A's, pass it out in the V's. Okay? Everybody okay? Now, you guys all know recursive programming is one of those things that's just a little hard to wrap your head around. But once you get it, it's not very hard at all. So towers of Hanoi and factorial and I don't know what else, golden numbers and a few other of those little fancy ones, they're very nice examples to teach Recursive programming. Recursive programming has its uses. It's not the magic bullet that takes care of all our problems, of course, but if we're going to program recursively at a high level, we have to know how to do it at a low level, too. We've got to be able to translate that into assembly code, don't we? 
and I should go on and say not only we have to, compilers have to be able to know how to, or there's no point in writing recursive code if it can't be implemented in a low level, because machines don't run high level code. Machines only run low level code. All right, this is a great place to take a break, because when you come back, we're going to have to wrap our head around recursive assembly language programming, okay? So go back and, you know, you think about factorial a little bit, look at that C code, take a nice break, get some oxygen, come back in, and then we'll dig into the assembly, okay? All right, have a good break. Ten minutes later, we'll see you again. <laughs>